Welcome to our seminar organized by IHE Delft. Today we will have the topic Paradigm Lost on the value of lost causes in transforming cities and water systems. Development Pathways by an alumnus and Dr. Jonathan Godinez Madrigal. Before making doing the introduction, I would like to invite everybody to silence the microphones and to keep it silent during the whole event. And of course, let us know your country of residence and place of work to facilitate the networking. After the seminar, we will have a time for questions and answers. So I invite you also to write your questions in the chat. Good, my name is Maria Laura Sorrentino. I'm an alumni relations officer at IHE Delft, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator of this event today and to have the presence of an alumnus as a speaker and my colleague BJ as a technical support of this event. But let us talk of our seminar. I would like to introduce very briefly to Jonathan. You can read his complete CV and work at the webpage of IHE Delft. But Jonathan is born in Mexico, in Guadalajara, and he was always very interested in social, in socio environment problems and a passionate person about finding new ways to address them. He first graduated from the International Relations in 2007 in the Jesuit University of Guadalajara, where he learned how economics, culture, and politics influence international conflict and cooperation. But about all, above all, the ethics and the serving, the underprivileged, and the urge to transform the world. He came to IHE Delft to follow the PhD program, and he graduated last year. His thesis, Paradigm Lost on the Value of Lost Causes in Transforming Cities and Water Systems Development Pathway. That was his focus. And it focused on a conflict that take place in Mexico. He began studying the conflict over the El Zapotillo project in 2015. For over 16 years, this project has been a cause of tension within the Mexican state of Jalisco. The construction of the of a dam within the Verde River Basin aimed to address water supply challenges in two prominent cities. However, the project also posed a threat to three villages placed in the homes of an ancestral lands of the residents at risk flooding. The construction of the land dam led to a conflict that had long been considered intractable. By collaborating with the communities and proposing workable alternative solutions for both the water supply and the cities and the security of villages, Jonathan facilitate a break out of the parties involved. The very important point of this thesis also is that was awarded the prize for the best interdisciplinary PhD thesis in the Netherlands by the Royal Holland Society of Science and Humanities. This thesis achievement holds even greater significance as it marks the inaugural presentation of this esteemed prize. And the thesis was uh, the selected one anonymously chosen by the jury among 70, 76 submissions of thesis of all university in the Netherlands. Congratulations, Jonathan. And as he says, this prize is a recognition of the unawaring grit of Mexican communities of Temacapulim, as Casico and Palmarejo to resist overwhelming oppression and imposition of the state. Good. With other further words, I would like to invite Jonathan to have his presentation. Thank you, Maria, for, for your kind words and, and, and your introduction of uh, my work and myself. And, and then, uh, well, welcome everybody that uh, is coming from all around the world. Thanks a lot for being interested in, in my research, in, in 
for have done in my PhD. Okay, so uh, as uh, Maria already mentioned, so the name of my thesis is called Paradigm Lost on the Value of Lost Causes in Transforming Cities and Water Systems and Development Pathways. So first of all, like El, El, where do we start? No, El, El, We start by something that seems counterintuitive, that water conflicts can have a positive dimension. Is that possible? Because water conflicts, they usually have a bad reputation uh, everywhere in the media, in many countries. Nobody wants to be in conflict, seems like. No, like if you're in conflict personally with your family, with uh, at work or something, people don't like to have this conflict going on. Uh, and the common sense dictates that we need to avoid them at all costs because they usually are destructive. Nevertheless, I claim that some conflicts may signal inadvertent problems or symptoms in water systems. The same way happens also at work or, or even between nations. There is an underlying issue going on in that uh, a conflict is just the, the symptom of uh, or the presentation of that uh, underlying problem that is going on. So therefore, I claim that uh, water conflicts, they have a generative dimension. So water conflicts, uh, they are as an, an emerging symptoms in unsustainable water systems. Therefore, conflict, as well as crisis, they have an influence on water systems management and, and evolution. So then uh, the question that is, uh, uh, that is uh, rumbling now is that can conflicts understood as critical moments can open windows of opportunity to reform unsustainable water systems? Because then this is this is what's happening here. No, like if a water system is sustainable and it's just, then it wouldn't it would never have any sort of uh, conflict going on. Therefore, uh, if uh, water systems are unsustainable and, and unfair, then this elicits the possibility of having conflicts going on. Then the hypothesis that I try to prove is that for conflicts to to have a generative dimension then they need to be driven by actors with legitimacy. So uh, this I will try to prove by the end of the presentation. So uh, I, in, in my thesis, I tried to, to have a contribution to the fields of, uh, of knowledge of political ecology, peace and conflict studies, and socio-technical transitions. So the study and, and our understanding of what the conflicts is still in, in its infancy. So th this is something that I was really surprised in, um, in while I was doing my, my research is that uh, the water conflicts, we still don't really understand them and conflicts in general as well. No? So then uh, water conflicts are conceived either as preventable events, eh? like uh, this is the, the view of the peace and conflict studies, when, uh, conflicts that can be prevented and we should be able to prevent them. Uh, or they are a collision of worldviews, values, and power to control uh, water flows, which is the idea of uh, political ecology. And, and just if, if you allow me a little bit, uh, I hear a lot of uh, noise, and I, I will just close the window. Yeah, thank you. And. Uh, the, these um, uh, fields of knowledge, they do not relate uh, conflict to social processes and dynamics from the perspective of complex systems that in the long term lead to, to systemic changes in socio-technical uh, systems. For example, in this case, urban water systems. So then uh, there is uh, an emerging field of knowledge, uh, for instance, social hydrology that, that uh, understands that complex systems such as uh, urban water systems is uh, is a combination or or a or a, um, or a coupled system of uh, human and, and nature and they interact with each other so then how to think of water conflicts in this idea of complex system it is not well understood yet so i will start uh, by trying to to uh, explain what is the position and the perspective of uh, peace and conflict studies they claim that there is a direct relationship between an increasingly variable climate uh, that is assumed as the main driver of social environmental conflicts. So then for one of the most important examples or cases that they have used 
to 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 make this case they have just the 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 war and the revolution in syria in uh, 2013 in and then they were able to see that there was a, a trend as you can see in the in the image above uh, in which the climate has become more variable in the past decades and then therefore they claim that this variability in climate and 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 and, and the uh, hydrological regime it had an impact or it had a, a, a causal relationship that caused uh, a water conflict. However, this is a very deterministic approach, you know, as if uh, we humans are incapable of, of uh, trying to find an, an agreement and not fall into war or fall into conflict. And the biggest example of that is precisely the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands have been for the past five years undergoing a series of droughts, and we haven't seen a conflict or, or much less a war happening. So there's there's a deterministic approach that we should consider um, as uh, 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 not acceptable. Huh? Um, it also does not address the structural and dynamic sociopolitical factors underlying conflicts. So then, of course, uh, the, the, the situation uh, or the ground truth in Syria was really complex already since uh, uh, for, for many years before a drought seemed to have triggered um, uh, these conflicts. So, so then, uh, how does the structural and dynamic sociopolitical factors uh, are also interacting with the weather? That is something that has been trying uh, to 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 shed some light on, but the still results are really un inconclusive. So also the the cases are not studied ethnographically. So we have no idea how different actors are and uh, have the, they're having different perspectives. They have different kind of power relationships with other actors. Then we can also not differentiate between the various actors acting at different scales and motivations. This is also related to to, to the ethnographic research. And uh, if we don't consider or differentiate actors with different motivations and, and, and acting at different scales, you no, know, like a local, uh, national, even international, then we don't understand how also the climate can also have an impact locally as well as, as nationally. There's also not a comprehensive uh, um, uh, solutions based on good practices because then uh, usually peace and conflict studies they say like oh like you have to have good practices in order to avoid having a conflict uh, in, in any country. And then, but however, this uh, can address, this may fail to address the unequal conditions that produce the conflict in the first place. This is quite important. Um, some conflicts are produced by, by uh, as I mentioned before, the structural and dynamic uh, sociopolitical factors that they, they perhaps, they just uh, created the ripe situation for a country in which the climate just represented as only a trigger of that. But then if we ignore that, then any, good can, any kind of good practices are going to fail. Then, because of that, this can depoliticize conflicts. Yeah? Because then, you know, like a, a, no actor have any responsibility. They don't bear any responsibility in, in, in the conflict because apparently the, the whole culprit then is the, is the climate. Then the politicization of conflicts can backfire because they will just reproduce the conflict and the war in the in, in in the future, yeah, Be, in, without addressing the underlying structural and dynamic sociopolitical factors. So then, uh, now I, I want to explain how this relates to the Zapotillo project in Mexico. So, in a nutshell, I'm going to explain what what, what um, is the is, is the issue that has caused a conflict for the past twenty years in Mexico, which is that uh, two cities, as you can see in the map above, Guadalajara and León. Uh, painted in, in blue and, and, and in green. And they have been experiencing water shortages for the past decades. So the, uh, they have, have been experiencing water deficit uh, uh, that is experienced in a way that uh, the, the local aquifers are overexploited. Then also experience in a way that uh, many regions of the, of the cities, they don't have access to water uh, 24 hours and seven. They have intermittent water access. Um, and then what has been the solution uh, proposed by the government? Well, then it was just to create a large scale um, water project, which is called the Zapotillo project. And then you can see that in the map, there's an inverse 
pyramid there in the in the uh, green line that represents the 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 Verde River. Then uh, then they pretended to have uh, to accumulate water to be able to send it or, or to do a tra water transfer all the way to Leon. Uh, you can see that in the in the dotted line as well as just uh, to deliver water to Guadalajara and via the same course of the river. Then, as you can imagine, then so, so this is a, an interbasin water transfer, no? uh, having water being accumulated in one place and then transfer all the way to, to, to cities uh, that are lying outside of that basin, Guadalajara and Leon. Then, as you can imagine, that uh, this water or this infrastructure was not well received locally because this uh, this infrastructure would mean that uh, at least 600 people would need to be relocated from the homeland as well as the whole region would need to 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 just give up water that is a semi-arid and also happens to be the second largest producer of animal protein in the whole country and even home of the second largest egg producer in the world. So then you can imagine that this region is economically vibrant, uh, vibrant and then they are supposed to give up their water for these two cities. So then, uh, because of that, there was uh, a conflict, a water conflict for 20, uh, for, for 20 years, uh, in which the dam was already built at 80 meters, as you can see in the picture below. 80 meters height, but then they wanted to continue the, the construction uh, another 25 meters to 105 meters in total. But then the, the, the project was uh, stopped at 80 meters height and then for 15 years having been used. So it has been only half built, but never put in use because there was uh, this social conflict present. So in the meanwhile, for 15 years, Guadalajara and León having uh, also increased the water deficit because the, the economy and the population keeps growing. And then if they don't have water, then it means that the, the water deficit keeps increasing. So what happens when, 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 when the water deficit keeps increasing is that the pressure, the political pressure keeps also increasing and the conflict is getting worse and worse and worse. So to be able to understand the conflict, uh, we need to understand also the, the uncertainties. So in, in, in to be able to, to analyze what are conflicts, we need to analyze the epistemic and social controversies, which are the heart and soul of the conflicts. The first uncertainty and controversy is the, is the policies to achieve water security in Guadalajara and León, which means that uh, el, there is not a, a given or a, a, or a comprehensive solution to uh, be able to to bring about water security for these two cities, because they're the, the gamut of, of possibilities of solutions, they're huge. So there's not only one possible solution. Uh, so the government, uh, they argue that the best way to, to achieve water security in Guadalajara and León was to build uh, a water supply augmentation project. So increasing the water supply. And then the people against this project, they argue that why? Why you haven't considered also demand management? No, this also possible. No, like a, it's not that there's a water deficit, but that, that water deficit means that the people are consuming much more water than they should. Yeah. So then uh, just to give you an idea, in Guadalajara and Leon, they are they are using around 200 liters per day per person. When, for example, in the Netherlands, that has much more water. They are using uh, 120 liters per person per day. So then you can see that there's a, a, a huge room for improvement. No, for example, the physical losses in the urban water system in both cities is around 30 percent. 30 percent of the water goes down the drain. Why? Because the the distribution network is so old. We're talking about almost 100 years old. But then the the faulty pipes are just cracking. And then because the, the 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 pipes are cracking, then it means that the water pressure cannot be elevated. And then that means that there's also water intrusion in pipes, which means that uh, people are receiving soft water quality in the homes. 
uh, and then uh, they cannot drink it. And therefore, also in Mexico, it happens to be the, the number one consumer of uh, bottled water in the world. Then, so then you can imagine that then this, this created or this became a huge controversy. Like, is this the, is the Zapotillo project uh, ideal for Guadalajara and León or can, do we have more uh, other solutions that have a lot of potential as well? So the second uh, uncertainty and controversy is the ne negative consequences into the donor basin of Los Altos de Jalisco, which is the, don the donor basin, yeah? So then, as, as I mentioned already, then and this is a uh, hugely productive region, semi-arid, and then is, is now, of course, experiencing uh, many of the um, climate change consequences by having variability in, 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 uh, in, 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 in the basin. So then this became also a source of controversy because then if you have a lot of variability, would it even be feasible to have a dam that is going to continue, continuously uh, uh, transfer water to two cities? Uh, many of the local people, they say, no, the river is dry. Where are you going to get the, the water to be able to, to, pump, to pump it uh, to, to Guadalajara, and Guadalajara and León? And then even if there's water, that water should, should be for us, you know, for, to, 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 to feed the water that is, uh, uh, is, it, that is the motor of the economy uh, of Los Altos de Jalisco, which is, uh, is agricultural. Then, of course, uh, there, there is this social issue you know, that uh, uh, why should these people the, that, is, that are living in the... In the uh, reservoir or the dam, why should they need to be sacrificed in order to provide water for, for these cities that are not even doing their best in in having um in managing their water? No. So then these two uncertainties and controversies became crucial in understanding the conflict. So for many years there was an impasse, no, uh, there was not going anywhere because then uh, everybody thought and everybody came up with their own data. So, so now in, in this er, era of uh, post-truth, anybody can, can make their own data and argue for or against something. So in 2017, the government hired UNOPS, which is the United Nations Office, Office for Project Services, to enter the fray and be able to... to um, develop a water model of the donor basin to to test different kind of um, uh, scenarios and then try to uh, to answer the question if the Zapotillo dam was actually feasible or not. So then they develop, uh, as I mentioned, the whole water model, a dynamic water model of the whole region, how much water is raining, how much water is being pumped, how much water is being used, how much water is lost to evapotranspiration, et cetera, et cetera. And then they tested uh, the model with uh, five different kind of scenarios, uh, testing also different kind of, uh, of, of uh, heights of the dam. So as you can see here, uh, 105 meters for the first scenario, uh, but then fewer um, water transfer in the second scenario. Then the, the same kind of uh, water volumes being transferred, but with a lower dam at 80 meters height, uh, etc. You know. So then, in 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 the in all of the scenarios, they used um, hi historic data and current water dynamics. Yeah, and then only in the fourth one, they used a scenario with climate change and future water demand. But then the the one. The one scenario that they were able to to optimize in in order to 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 find the feasibility of the dam was the, the scenario number five, in which they reduced thirteen percent of the of the water volumes being transferred uh, to Guadalajara and León. Why? Because then they realized that some of the data, some of the knowledge that that was being volleyed by 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 the oppositors of the dam. They were right. There was a uh, uh, higher water demand in the region that was not acknowledged by the water authorities. So then they claim, okay, well, we acknowledge that, but uh, you need to decrease the water being transferred 
the water flows from the dam to Guadalajara León by 13%. And then you will see that in the coming 60 years, which is the, the life expectancy of the dam, then it will never be, it will never be, become empty for the next 60 years. So then if you if you just build the, the dam 105 meters and just reduce 13%, then it's good to go. However, uh, what I did was to request this model from UNOPS, then I replicated these results to be able to, to understand how the model was built. And what I found was that uh, if you just include climate change and future water demand in, in, uh, in the Donald region, alas, then the scenario that I found was that the dam gets empty years of usage. That means, so this was a bomb in, in, in the conflict because then it showed that, of course, like if you want to be serious about el, el, doing scenarios, developing scenarios, you have to, you, you must include future water demand in the region and you must include climate change in your scenarios. So then when you included those, then the dam wasn't feasible at all. So then uh, after three years of work and more than $6 million spent in UNOPS, then the the science policy process failed miserably yeah so then the conflict continued because then nobody believed the results of UNOPS and then uh, the dam was not built at 105 meters in height and then it continued to be um, stalled to be stopped and, and and to not be used so then uh, from the from this i gathered some uh, results no, and which is that the role of science should not be limited to evaluating infrastructure projects, but to critically analyze the the uh, the water human systems to open the the space for decision. Yeah. So then, what I found is that if UNOPS would have opened the the the, the, the space for decision to also include some of the uh, other alternatives that had that had been proposed by the people opposing the project, then in that way the conflict may have had a chance to actually uh, be solved because they failed to do that because they only consider the Zapatillo Dam as the only solution, then uh, his results were not legitimate. So then, el, el, then I proceeded to do exactly what I thought they were missing, which is to understand the system as a whole. So then uh, I, I want to, to, to mention this, uh, this quotation by Henry David Thoreau that I really love. It says, in my brief experience of human life, the external obstacles, if any, have not been living men, but institutions of the dead. It is pleasing to make your way through this uh, last generation as through the dewy covered grass. Men are as innocent as mourning to those who do not suspect. I love humanity, but I hate the institutions of the cruel dead. Men execute nothing so faithfully as the wills of the dead down to, to the last codicil and letter. They rule this world and the living are but its executors. Even virtue ceases to be such if it is stagnant. A man's life must constantly be as fresh as this river. It must be the same channel, but new water at every moment. This, this is to us as a path dependency, locking systems, feedback mechanisms that generate vicious cycles and ideological devices to keep doing the same um, result the same actions over and over and over, even though they fail to do to, to help. And I saw this happening in, in both Leon and Guadalajara. So then they I found that there was a supply demand cycle in Guadalajara, in, in, which means that a city can can no longer be self-sufficient in terms of its water supplies because of its constant constant growth. And then you may think, okay, this is obvious, no? This is obvious because then if the city keeps growing, it needs more water. Yes and no. So the Zapotillo project was the continuation of the development path of a large scale water supply implementation. And then I found that through a historic research of the city in which what I found was that every time that there was a water supply implementation, then the the water demand increased artificially. How was I able to, to, to understand this? By locking together the water use from the population 
uh, proportionally. So you can see that in the first 40 years, uh, since 1908 until 1950, the population and the water demand are growing together. Yeah, so uh, uh, as far as there, then the, the, the theories complain, no? It's common sense. More, more people, more water is needed. But then when the city starts to develop new water supply systems or, or, or new water supply sources, then the, the dynamics of water use and population, they are un uncoupled. Yeah, so in 1956, what the city uh, introduced the water transfer from a lake, then you can see that the water demand is started to, to increase. Yeah? The water demand is the blue line. So the water, the water demand starts to increase artificially and uncoupled from, from the growth of population. Then this trend just continue over the years while more and more water supply sources incorporated into the system. And then you can see that in the in the years that uh, the city was experiencing water shortages, which is around the uh, 90s and 2000s, then is when the water use has started to, to become closer to the natural growth of the population. So then with the Zapotillo project, then it'll, the expected water use was going to be expected to increase by almost 20 points, yeah? Uh, in that way, to continue the, the trend of increasing separation between water use, water demand, and population, meaning that uh, there is an unexpected consequence of building more and more water supply sources is that people consider that there is more water. And because there's more water, I can use much more. And then I realized that uh, every time that the government would uh, present or develop a new water source, they would always say, this water source is, is going to guarantee water for, for the city forever. We will never need a, need a new one. And what happens after 15, 20 years, we need a new one. Because they would never expect that, um, that the people, the population, would increase the water supply uh, I mean, sorry, they will increase the water demand artificially. So then there is a paradox of increasing, increasing water supply in the cycle of the water supply and, and demand. So there is, a, again, a, a coupled system in the water system. So it means that uh, there is a water shortage. Whenever there's a water shortage, there's an economic damage. So there, this translates pressure. More public pressure becomes uh, or is translated into an increasing reservoir storage, which also increases the water supply. And then the government, they only consider the blue cycle. No, If we have more water supply, then we will uh, solve the issue of water shortages. What they don't understand is that th this creates an um, unexpected consequence of increasing artificially the water demand and by creating the water demand they will also ensure that in the future there will be a water shortage and this creates or, or makes the cities be dependent as well as vulnerable for economic damage because then they have already built the water demand but they don't have any more any sources for uh, any extra supply sources for water supply so then by building the Zapotillo Dam, it also meant that uh, in the future, they will no longer be able to, su to supply water to this artificially or created water demand in for Guadalajara and Lemuel. So then what happened? After the, the fiasco of UNOPS in, in 2023, there was a plan to retrofit the Zapotillo Dam And to, uh, as you can see in, the, in this last picture, they were able to, to, to crack open six windows of uh, uh, 12 meters by 12 uh, meters in depth. Why? Because then the, the, the conflict was resolved. The conflict was resolved in, 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 in a way that uh, it protected the communities that were going to be relocated because of the dam while still being be able to reduce its, its water transfer to only Guadalajara. So what happened? Yeah. Uh, what I claim is that uh, uh, 
so the new always happens against the overwhelming also of statistical laws in under probability, which for all practical everyday purposes amount to certainty. The new therefore always appears in the guise of a miracle. But, and this is a, a quote I love because then it, it almost felt like a miracle. How did it happen that uh, this dam was able to be retrofitted and the communities were able to win this uh, this whole conflict? So then uh, I want to, to then uh, unravel this guise of a miracle. So what, what happened was that in 2018, after I... Uh, replicated the results of UNOPS, then I also refurbished the model to be able to do what UNOPS was unable to do, which is to uh, create new different water alternatives for new water solutions for the dam, and uh, sorry, for, for the cities, for Guadalajara and Leon. So then I incorporated in the model all of the different kind of uh, alternatives, alternatives that uh, the oppositors of the dam we're proposing for the past 15 years, which is like, for example, to install uh, water uh, harvesting systems in both cities to be able to uh, 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 also have a water, uh, sorry, a water, uh, uh, yeah, like to, to buy the water rights from farmers to be able to use that, that water um, sources instead of the farmers. Uh, to be able to fix the leakages in the in the system, and then uh, in that way, I invited all of the key actors in the conflict to to do um, a participatory uh, modeling, uh, and then to let them play this this uh, this water model by also developing a user interface that will be uh, user friendly so so that the 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 people that don't have experience or are not technical they, they will also be able to just click uh, easy steps in the in the user in the user interface and then develop their own scenarios they were able to test uh, different kind of scenarios and then see how it would uh, uh, yeah like happen in the future no like a, a, what would be efficient, what will be feasible, what not. And then they were able to, to uh, in this workshop, to compare the results also with the government, also with the communities, also with the farmers. And then they will have uh, a new understanding of the system, as well as a new proof that there is more alternatives than only a dam. Yeah. So then what happened was that after this workshop, then the, many of the uh, the, so, the social actors that were uh, uh, trying to 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 prove their case that there's alternatives to the dam, then finally they had the proof available, and then they started a campaign, a social campaign, and communicational campaign, saying like, "Hey, we need to 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 look away from the dam. Yeah, the dam is not feasible, and and it's even dangerous because it makes the cities to be vulnerable." To, uh, uh, to droughts and hydroclimatic changes. So then what I found is that this vicious cycle that I showed you before can be broken, can be broken by the same actions and, and, um, and advocacy of actors by developing alternative, um, alternative de development pathways that could contribute to open up the decision space and then have an uncertain outcome and also be able to reduce the water demand as well as increase the water supply. And because now we're conscious, we're aware of this cycle and we can we can design solutions to avert this, this cycle. So then there's a difficulty to understand change, how change functions. So then I, I did um, uh, ethnographic research to be able to understand how a bunch of farmers, a bunch of people who don't have any any master as you guys, you know, like you you guys, like many of you came to Delft to, to, to learn, to do a master degree, to have a master degree on many different expertise. And then, you know, you guys know a lot, but then these people, they, they just probably only have their secondary education finished and they were able to transform this conflict 
not only by force, but also by presenting alternatives, yeah? So then what I found was that uh, we need to unpack the social capitals from social movements as agents of change in coupled with the human systems. It, mean, it means that people have different kind of skills, uh, which I call social capitals, because then you can put a capital to, to reproduce itself. So actors in water conflicts, they, they own different kind of capitals understood as intangible goods put to reproductive use. So they have social capital, which is the legitimacy. If uh, different actors can see the social movement as legitimate, as an illegitimate actor, it means that the people will listen more to them. Then they also increase the, their technical capital, which is knowledge. And then in that way, uh, uh, I, she dealt uh, through my project, as well as, as the support of my two uh, supervisors, Peter van der Sach and Nora van Kauenberg, we were able to develop knowledge that would also increase the, the technical capital of the movement. This also increased the relational capital, which is network. So then because of uh, IHE, we also supported the movement to also have different kind of relationships, for example, with uh, consultancy firms in Switzerland to be able to, to have um, a better com comprehension of the dam and, and, to, and to propose to, to um, uh, drill all these seven windows into the, in, in, in the dam uh, because they, they, they became spillways. Then uh, economic funding, which they found in, uh, in actors living in the United States, uh, people who migrated from Mexico to the United States, they were able to have more, more funding because of that and then support the movement as well as legal capital, no? el, el, which legal strategy can, can yield a better result than human rights. No? So during the conflict, they accumulated these capitals by implementing different strategies to achieve their interest. Then uh, I was able to map the, the, how these capitals uh, were evolved throughout the conflict. And then you can see that in, in the first period of the conflict, which is in 2005, then the capitals of the of the, of the agents and of the social movement was quite small, no? Because then they just uh, were just literally only farmers, so they only have a little bit of legitimacy and relational capital. Well, the government they had a huge capital; they could do everything with. So that's why they were able to build them, yeah, for the for the coming five years. But then in those five years, the the actors, the social movements, they didn't remain, remain idle. They kept working to develop their capitals. Then in that way, they started a campaign, a, a legal campaign that would prove su successful to stop the dam legally um, because of certain factors of, uh, uh, they were able to argue that uh, this would affect the, their human rights. And because of that, they were able to stop this dam. They also increased their, their social capital, their legitimacy, as well as increase also their their economic capital. Then, in the third period, in, in the third period, there was a political formation. They they, and they they were able to understand the different strategies to navigate the political system in in Mexico, and then to to also start gaining more more legitimacy. Uh, and, and more of also some technical capital, but then you can see that because of that, the government they they hired UNOPS, and then they were still having the 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 higher hand in the conflict uh, by trying to solve the the, the conflict through uh, through science. No, and however, in the last period, so we're talking about since nine uh, two thousand nineteen all the way to two thousand two thousand twenty two that the, the social movement was able to accumulate much more capital than, than the coalition for supporting for the Zapotillo project. And it was in that moment when they were able to, to, to convince the president of Mexico to uh, carve all these six windows in, in, into, the, the, dam, into the, the dam and uh, support the cause of the, of the social movement to avoid any kind of cost in uh, in, in in being relocated, no. So then, for the future, uh, will the cities of Guadalajara and León be able to seize the opportunity to transition to an inclusive and sustainable urban water system? 
or will they not be able to resist the temptation to execute the mandato of the death by repeating again temporary solutions based on large infrastructures? The coin is tossed. We are at the crossroads that will take us to two completely opposite destinations. Uh, but for now, the, the fortune seems to be smiling to the communities that they, they are aiming to not be relocated and to keep their, um, their ancestral land untouched. Uh, and now it is still a time for uncertainty, but uh, it seems like for now, the supply demand um, cycle has been temporarily uh, disrupted. So uh, because of this, uh, we were able to find that the scientists, they have a, not only a mandate to produce science, but also to produce actionable science that can have an impact social. So thank you very much. This is uh, the, the end of my presentation and I'm really open to any questions and have a nice discussion with all of you. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and I will share my screen if I can to uh, just start with the first questions. That the first one comes from Professor Gopa Kumar from India, and the question is, was there no AEA conducted before sanctioning of the El Zapatillo project by Mexico government? El Thank you for the question. El, let me see. El, Can you see my screen? Uh, no, I cannot see your screen. Okay, let's see what happened. Okay, now? Yes, I can see it now. Yes, perfect. Okay. So, El, what? What was the environmental impact assessment conducted? Yes, there was environmental impact assessment. However, uh, the problem was that it, it was a really uh, biased environmental impact assessment because they only made this assessment on, their, on, on the area of the reservoir. So this means that they only consider an environmental impact assessment in, in, a, in a very contained um, area that did not include the whole of the basin so then because of that, then they were able to just comply with the law, but not really understand the meaning of the law. Because the meaning of the law is that if the project was going to cause any irreversible damage to the environment, but then they only consider the, the, the small hectares contained within the reservoir, but did not include the whole of the, of the basin. So this was also a contentious uh, uh, part of the conflict. Very good. And Hassan Mohamed would like to, to know how to solve water scarcity and groundwater depletion. Well, thanks for the question, Hassan. Well, I can imagine that, that you are asking this question for the specific case uh, that, that I mentioned. And then I can, I would say that the question perhaps is not it's not the right question to ask because then what I think the question is is what is causing water scarcity? So if water scarcity is being caused by by an overdraft by artificial created water demand, so imagine that uh, we have the water demand of one thousand uh, uh, liters per day per person. Then the question is not how to to, to supply water to 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 this person who is. Uh, having this huge water demand, but the question is like, is, isn't that too much? No. So then, perhaps the water scarcity is being caused by a large water demand, and and we shouldn't think be thinking only on, with the eyes of the water supply, and and just create more water supply sources because then it's just unsustainable. No. So then, the groundwater depletion is also a cause of the huge water demand that it was that is present in the in these regions. So the question is, uh, is, is not to think to, to, to replace the water source, but to be able to, to, to see if there's a space for uh, water demand management, I think. Thank you, Jonathan. And Samar Mahmoud uh, requests, 
When considering the future water demand and climate change in your assessment, do you estimate it based on current demand patterns and physical losses or assume better water management strategies? Could you elaborate more on the climate change factors considered? Thanks for the question, Samara. So, so then there are two moments of my research. One in which I consider future water demand and climate change uh, only to prove that the study of UNOPS, what they didn't consider them. Yeah. So then what I did was to, to, to replicate the results, also introducing what future water demand and climate change. Uh, and then in the second moment, I also introduce better water demand, uh, sorry, uh, better water management strategies as the one I mentioned, which is that, okay, like if in these cities it's raining almost 800 millimeters per, per year, then it's possible also to just capture this water yeah, as a new water source that is just currently being wasted and uh, just flowing uh, into, the, in, into the sewers. No? So then, uh, of course, in this second moment, I also included uh, climate change uh, and also included uh, future water demand just to be able to have a, a, a better understanding you know, of, uh, of uh, how the scenarios would, would, uh, would play out considering these two uh, variables. Thank you very much. And Masni Dita Angriani would like to know how did you measure the social capital, political capital, and other capitals quantitatively? Thank you, Masni. This is a, a really super good question. Uh, this was a, a really difficult, um, a, a difficult methodolo methodological obstacle that we faced in, 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 in the research. So then, because we we saw, you no, know, like uh, we were able to see uh, in, in, in our study of 18 years that there, there has been a change in the way the actors were. Um, were uh, um, deploying their strategies and, and the way they were perceived by other actors. So then the, the question was like, qualitatively, we were able to see that there was a difference in, in, in the capitals and, 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 and their skills. No? The question was how to do it quantitati quanti quantitatively. So then what we, uh, um, what we decided was to be able to, to structure the conflict in four periods and then just to be able to see if it, if it has been like crucial changes in the way that the different capitals were used and, and deployed in, in, in the conflict, and then to see if they have been more or less in the, in the new conflict period. And then uh, by doing so, we were able to say like, okay, like in the, in the new period, the, 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 the capital was more. We just don't decide uh, how much more. We just say like, okay, like one one point more or one point less, and then in that way, in the four periods, we were able to see like this really nice evolution of the capitals that also coincided well with how the each in in each period, each conflict period, and uh, there was winning or losing for the two groups of actors. So, but in, indeed, this is a really good question. And in in my uh, I have an upcoming article that is about to be published. And we we uh, acknowledge that this is something that still needs to be discussed in the future. How to quantit quanti quantitatively be able to 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 assess the the capitals of the of the actors. And we think that perhaps uh, for further research. Uh, uh, um, a, a new method could be the, the Delphi method, which is based on, on having an, an, um, an interview with key actors and ask them what do they think is their expert opinion uh, on, 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 on how the capitals are evolving over time. But uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question. Thank you, Masni. There are a few questions on the on the chat. Um, and Ellen Barbosa, uh, sorry, uh, Tena, a uh, good line and request if you have considered the environment's legitimate water use right. Yes, in, in, indeed. I'll, I'll thank you for the question. In the, 
participatory modeling uh, that I designed and that, and that I developed, one of the options was to to for for the actors to be able to to prioritize the environment. So in in that sense, to be able to in any kind in any kind of a scenario to be able to 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 assure that the environmental flows would be compliant. Uh, and then of course, uh, this is actually by law, no? that uh, any kind of uh, water development should have uh, environmental flows considered. Uh, so in, in that way, uh, the, the actors, they were able to, to just click on, on that option in the, in, in the user interface to be able to make sure that the environment is taken care of. And then if they wouldn't do that, then explain why and with the other actors, but they let everybody comply that, I mean, this is the law and this this is something that we want to, to, to achieve. Thank you, Jonathan. And we are reaching our end time of this conversation, but uh, for the ones who had to leave, you are no problem, uh, leave the room, but I will take a few minutes more to just say a comment and an extra question, but not uh, before saying thanks to Jonathan for the excellent presentation. There's a lot of uh, excellent comments for you, Jonathan. Thank and uh, also to announce that in November, we are going to have our next online seminar that I will be informing the webpage of IEG Delft and also send the invitation through social media and by email to all alumni. And of course, thank you very much for your constant participation. The video will be available on IHE Delft YouTube channel and also will be sent to all persons who have registered for this event. But before closing, I would like to read a comment of Wangala Basaha, sorry for my pronunciation, that is an MSc alumnus of Water Management 2016-18, that he said that, I think, I quote, the implementation of the dam was done much faster than the involvement community. That's why they are convincing the community to be relocated when the project is already on the ground. Would you like to comment, Jonathan? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Manuela. Uh, indeed, so they didn't consider, or the authorities didn't consider, to to involve the communities in, into the decision making. So then, be, so then they had already made a decision to 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 build this dam before they even started to to do the social work of contacting the the communities and to involve them in the in the decision making process. So then, of course, it was also uh, uh, a really bad decision from the authorities because they just created a lot of animosity against the project and against the, the, the authorities. And even though the, 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 there was a, 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 a lot of uh, pressure from the, from, 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 the, from the authorities for the, for the communities to accept this, uh, this as, as, a, as a done deal, then this just made the communities like so angry, so against the project that they, I think they give them a lot of strength to just say like, hey, we, we have human rights and you are just trampling them. You know, like you need, you need to give us informed uh, processes to, to know what's going on and then give us the chance to also have the, uh, a say in, the, in, in this project and they did, did, didn't give it to them. Uh, so indeed, because of trying to hurry up the project, they actually, actually just trample the project and, and then created this conflict that lasted for 20 years, indeed. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So I'm going to go to the last questions of, of, of who was that? Of, 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 uh, oh my God, I cannot find it. Who wrote it? But I did not understand. Uh, he says exactly, oh, my cursor is not doing well. Sorry. I did not understand exactly what is causing such a high water demand of 200 liters a day to such a point of conflict. Also, when you talk of 200 liters, this is how much water is used or available? So the, el, I think the question can be answered by el, many, el, it's not only one answer, but it's many factors that el, involved in this really high number. So one of them, as I mentioned, is that the cities, they have a 30, 40 
percent of physical losses in the network. So this, so if you if you rest this two more than two hundred liters per day per person, forty percent only on physical losses, then you already have a, an, an answer to that. But also uh, another answer is just that the the authorities when they think they have a lot of water, then they start uh, approving any kind of development, economic development, and, and also like trying to 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 uh, increase the population of the city because there's a lot of mi internal migration in Mexico. So I think it's happening everywhere, no? Like the rural areas are just going into the cities. And then if the cities are just saying like, yes, 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 let's grow, let's grow, let's grow. Then you're, you're also artificially increasing the water demand. You, you cannot say no to any to, to any water demand. And, and, and then of course, there's the, the, the psychological part of water use that then if whenever people, they, they, they say like, uh, oh, you know, like we have a new water supply. And, and then everybody's saying that this is the answer, that this is the ultimate answer to the water security of, of, the, of the city, then people are just using more water, no? Like, uh, because they think that uh, the water is, is, is endless. And, and this is promoted by the government. They say water forever, literally, like over the course of 50 years, with every new water source, they say this is water forever. So then it just creates this image in, in, in the people that this water is literally forever when it is not. And then they, they they create a lot of water demand because of that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for your excellent work, uh, excellent presentation. We I think we all have enjoyed that. There is a lot of uh, comments in the chat. And I will close this uh, seminar of today saying thanks for the interest and all the persons who have registered. And uh, let us stay in touch. And of course, if you would like to give more quest uh, send more questions to Jonathan, do not hesitate to send it to me or to Jonathan that you can see his profile and contact details on the webpage of IEG Delft. Thank you very much to all and hope to welcome you in the seminar of November. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria and everybody. Thank you.